Yeah. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Onur. So it's a four letter, somewhat difficult to pronounce sometimes. But anyway, uh, currently I'm located in Norway, Oslo. Uh, as I said, it's like 2 2.20 p.m. right now. Uh, and it's a little bit dark, uh, unfortunately. And Norwegians happen to like uh, dim lights in everywhere. Uh, so I try to adjust my zoom and camera as much as possible. Uh, currently, I work uh, at Microsoft uh, as a front end developer. Though throughout my most of my career, I was a back end developer. I work on the, a platform for I think for twenty years. Used used it uh, since one zero beta. Uh, my acquaintance with function programming is actually started with another language called Nimurli. Maybe you heard it. Uh, it was actually a fantastic language uh, developed as a um, thesis, master thesis in 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 a Polish university. Uh, though um, there was some activity, and I also contributed language, and I, I learned things like what's an option option type there. Then from there, I diverged to using F sharp, which actually especially with the with the with the fable um it somehow trans allowed me to translate myself uh to be a front end developer ironically uh so earlier i tried to learn react several times and i was jump jump back but thanks to uh f sharp and fable i was able to also uh learn to how to do how to program in react and I've become a front-end developer at Microsoft today. So uh, at work, I, I don't use uh, F Sharp uh, at, at this job, but in my previous job in Norway, I was I was a, a full-time front-end developer and using F Sharp for front-end for, for, for a year. I also have uh, some side projects. Uh, full, so effectively doing full stack F Sharp, um, doing the front-end and the back-end and the, the database persistence, et cetera. Uh, and also, I occasionally organize uh, workshops for for curious people. Um, so one of the reasons why I came up with this talk is that um, once you when you once you step in the functional functional programming realm, uh, a lot of things you learn in in the OP world starts not to apply. You just I mean, for example, let's say you want to do a standard CRUD application with, with, with F Sharp, then you immediately find yourself it's just surrounded with all these tools that is, that is designed for C Sharp. Then you start to use, again, entity framework and, for example, ORMs or whatever uh, database mapping tool you, you, you use. And then you just realize it's, it becomes just a little pointless to you to use a function program in the first place, if you're going to use the tools um, uh, that is designed for non-function programming uh, languages. So in that sense, which today's talk is about uh, CQRS, Command Query Responsible Segregation, it's actually a match made in heaven for functional programming languages because the uh, CQRS pattern is, is more like a message oriented an event-oriented uh, architecture, uh, unlike the uh, regular uh, conventional uh, architectural design patterns. In that sense, it, it makes it makes it a very well match, but also it's a little bit challenging how to how to how to uh, build up all of things and integrate all of things. How how would you do a real life application? I feel there's a, some sort of uh, shortage amount of information. So this is what I'm trying to address. And it's a, so this talk is about a um, CQRS by Akka.net, which is a very, very opinionated way of doing things. But I believe uh, for the curious people, it might give some ideas. Maybe they can just take the idea and apply it in a different form, or I don't know. So it's, that's that will be all up to you. So I'll share my screen. Uh, there will be some sort of slides. Um, during the talk, you can just stop me, interrupt me for, for anything you're curious, uh, you want me to dig further, uh, that's all fine uh, by me. That's all. It's 
Okay, so I assume you can see my slide. Your slide. I just of this thing. Okay. So when we talk about secure risk, it stands for command query responsible segregation. And it actually has several flavors. So actually, I'm oh, sorry. Didn't hold on. I, I, I think it's awesome that it's almost like a, a sort of a, a the, the company that uh, develops Akka.net is actually here in Houston. Uh, so it's, it's actually kind of a kind of a nice kind of, uh, you know, it's like it's crossed the world and come back. <laughs> yeah, that's true. I actually met the guy Aaron here when, when he came to Oslo NDC. Uh, I, I, had a, I had some good, good time with them. Uh, yeah, so I, I know about them. Yeah, and I'm pretty much in in in, in connection with them. Uh, he's, he's doing great stuff. Uh, I really uh, appreciate his effort doing this. Uh, although he's trying to use a commercial business, uh, it's a super valuable effort. So, uh, as I said, command responsible segregation it comes in several flavors. At first, it's it's there's a very lightweight form which you can just apply that if you don't want to go full blown CQRS, which is called uh, command query segregation, CQRS, and then uh, we'll talk about the differences. Then the a little bit more medium form, so you can do CQRS with or without event sourcing. Event sourcing is another methodology where your your um, you construct your process your data as sort of list of events instead of regular tables or regular persistence, whatever you're using. And then what you do is you just uh, go through these uh, e events and maybe able to replay them and then create some sort of projection, which we talk about it. And this is the uh, this is the flavor we'll cover. And probably vast majority of time, you would want to go with CQRS with event sourcing because this just um, it just really completes the, the, the pattern as well as it's somewhat very functional friendly, I would say. So the, the, let's talk about it's just what is CQRS? Why do we need it? And how do we use it? It's just we can, we can try to summarize in, in, in three steps. And then we can just talk about what is what what was it. Before a little bit diving into, into CQRS, let's just talk about the, the concepts. So as I said, it's a com I talked about the command and query. Actually, um, so what we tell, why, what, what, what we um, try to explain by command, it's something like some sort of message that's intention to uh, alter the state, okay? Let's say um, you want to order a pizza and you just say place order. So it represents some sort of demand. And typically in your in your security application from the command, you don't you don't return the state. It's not it's not the it's not the ideal way to 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 fetch the state. But as a query side, it just returns the data and you just don't touch that site. I mean, don't try to um, use the query side for altering the state. It's just it's it's sole existence is just to reading it. And there's also uh, due to asynchronicity. Um, it also, the query side usually returns some sort of stale data, but you have to live with it, which we'll talk about that as well. So this is some sort of important chart. Uh, you can see, um, and this just represents a flow, the flow of uh, one of the, one of the ways it represents the flow of CQRS, where we have a, a command handler and event handler. So a command handler is like something that accepts a command and it also it also accepts the state. It also somewhat gathers the state. Such as let's say you are you are ordering something, then the command would be a place order, and the state will be, for example, could be something like a stock amount, right? Then the command handler can just decide what would be the outcome. If, for example, if the, if there's enough stock uh, for the for the item, then it can just uh, generate an event, that is, such as order is placed, or we can just Reject the reject the reject the command such as the order is rejected because there's not, not there's not enough stock for that item, so that's the decision maker. 
But eventually what it does is it just generates the event and then that event is just going, goes to the event handler. And with the current state, it just generates a new state, such as if you have ordered something, then the stock amount will be reduced and that will be your newer state. And if you, if you run this cycle, if you place orders for, for a particular item, eventually you will consume all the all this, all, this, all your stock and then you will, be, uh, you will start to re emit rejection events in a, in a typical cycle. Um, so this is a little bit more, more broader picture of the architecture. So on the right-hand side, you can see just, there's a UI uh, and you, UI can talk to the, your, your, your backend via regular service interfaces. And you can see, actually, we tried to split the model into the, the command model and the query model. Uh, it's a very, very big distinction. I'll talk about the, the reason why we do that, but just, just talk, understand why we do that. And this is actually the, it's, it's just a CQS version of it. So it's, there's just a single common da database there and the command model and the query model share a single data model. And once you separate the model, then you end up with the CQS part. Uh, and here's another representation of the same pattern. On the left-hand side, you can see the typical um, CRUD application you, people develop. There's a presentation layer, abstraction layer, and domain layer. And in the, in the CQRS side, it's actually, you can see the dashed line. On the left part, you can see, uh, well, the, uh, the application and domain, it's somewhat separated from the, the query side again. Um, and here's another representation, and this is this is more. Uh, this represents this actually the, the CQS with event sourcing. Again, on the on the left hand side, you can see the presentation application layer. You you just uh, request for action, and then what happens is instead of your the, the classical tables you would just use in a CRUD application, well, there's some sort of I don't know orders table. You just instead of log the events, what happened in the system? Okay, uh, it's like a bank transaction book or ledger book kind of thing. So you just record what happened in the system, and there is another mechanism that runs in the backend, which, got, which I tend to call a projection engine, and then it just scans these events constantly, and then fulfills the data, whatever they, whatever you want. It could be multiple projection engines, which can then uh, construct the uh, read data store from that. So this this this, this thing continuously runs uh, as as the data is fed to the log of events. So there is you can you can think about uh, well I, talk is nice but have you ever used this thing in in in, in any real project? So I I work in Dubai for for some time like a three years, and the interesting bit about Dubai is that um, it it, it actually has the world's busiest airport in terms of international passenger traffic. They, they accept like a, around 100 million passengers per year. And uh, they have some sort of rules such as uh, all government offices must be uh, from, from, from the citizens, which only co constitutes the 20% of population. So you, you, as an expat, you can't have such a job or just you can't attend, attain citizenship or just, just they, they, come, they can have this kind of rules. And for that, uh, they have a tendency to automate everything as, as much as possible. Um, and one of the projects I work on is just did a something called a smart tunnel, where people just walk through a tunnel. Uh, and then while we're walking, it scans your eyes and it finds out who you are and completes your immigration process. You don't show any documents or you don't even stop. So uh, I can just briefly show the video, uh, although it's a little bit not technically related, uh, just 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 to show how it works. Um, just let's just just talk about the the, the tunnel part. Does it play? Um, let's actually, show the video here, maybe. <laughs> There is something. 
Uh, it's due to my headphone, I suppose. I don't know why I can't play this. So you can see the tunnel here in the back end. And then people just walk through. Um, Oh, it's a bit strange. Whatever. Okay, let's just skip this part. So it's it's some sort of tunnel, and this is something I used for. So uh, this pattern is something something I used in a real project. Um, let's move to the next slide. So one oh, of the things oh, is Connor, one. Can I yep. can I ask you a question? So when you say that you used it in this tunnel, what part exactly? You know, was it like moving the <laughs> the conveyor belt, or was it the camera? Yeah, well, it's it's the system. So there is one one system that feeds like incoming passenger. So typically, if you think of how how this system works, is that it's it's not possible. I mean, it's fairly fairly difficult uh, to find out a random person who is who he or she is from their eyes. Okay. I mean, considering there are millions of people, you can't just do that instantly. There's no such technology. So in order to do so, you need to find out who is coming. So you just have to limit the people's window, okay? So we have an integration with the airline. And then when, when someone checks into the air counter, then the airline notifies us, hey, someone is coming and I know their name. And then we just register the person into some sort of limited number of gallery, okay? Something like a 5,000 people. And once you walk through the tunnel, then it is possible. It is easy to find out someone from their eyes among five thousand people. Okay, and once you pass through the tunnel, we just figured out you have passed. Or if your flight is off, also um, your flight to take off, maybe you don't decide to visit the tunnel. Maybe you just didn't come to flight. We just remove from the gallery, and that way we always maintain a specific number of people that is registered in the gallery that could be recognized. So this whole system is just, a, there's a passenger feeding system and there's also a passenger consuming system. And in that sense, uh, we, we utilized uh, this pattern where uh, there are some commands and then uh, registering passengers and there's a system that just constructs the registered passengers table uh, from the event logs. And then uh, once, you, once you go through the channel, it just, finds that you, if you're registered, find your relevant details uh, and convey to the backend immigration system. So that's some, this kind of system. Mm -hmm. so it was a very cool project. I really enjoyed working and I still active. Yeah, yeah that's, <laughs> yeah. that's wonderful. <laughs> um, but I mean, that said, there is a certain, once you commit yourself something like a secure arrest, it's, it's actually a steep pattern. So it's, um, it may be something you, you, you're not willing to commit everything because you will, it, it requires a lot of stamina, to be fair, which I'll talk, I'll describe why it is. So in that sense, what I will suggest is that, so when you de develop a typical application, you can see the red line, which is like a, the, 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 the above front side is like a free front end and the back end side is like a, your, your back end. But also you should consider uh, fragmenting your architecture vertically, not just horizontally. That is, for example, it's like a bounded context, context concept where you have, for example, an application, you have an authentication stuff, you have transactions, for example, maybe a bank transaction, and there's a contact, for example, you're managing. So you can choose different architectures for, for different vertical slices. For example, for authentication, you can just use a CRUD level, it's all fine. And for your more valuable, more, you, you would get more benefit from SecureS, you could just commit for, for example, for the transactions for, the, for, this, for this pattern. Uh, so it's, it's 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 applicable to a single slice. This this is a better way to to handle the complexity. Um, uh, after all, you don't want to spend too much time on something that's already a solved problem like an authentication. But it's all up to you. So this is just uh, I just try to give a blip overview. What is it about? Uh, as I said, it's as a summary. Uh, there is some sort of commands that's feeding the system, and then you just generate a set of set of events, and there's some sort of projection. Uh, engine, which is just, just, just generate events. So why should I care, right? So 
I came, uh, people came up with this idea why this is important. It solves several problems that is actually people don't notice, which I will just talk about these problems. One of the things is, which is the most important, and you will you will not find this definition in anywhere. It it just requires you sometimes some sort of mental mental shift. Just like you remember uh, when you talk to a, a C sharp guy, hey, why do you use F sharp or why, why do you use function programming? It's very hard to explain because it's just something you 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 have this mind shift, right? And you know the answer, but it's it's a little bit hard to put on the words. So C crest also. It, in in some way, it's it it uh, it requires you to have some sort of mind shift, and the primary motivation to use why should I secure do secure is is that it it at least my personal primary reason it protects your domain. It's not about performance, not about concurrency or other things you you heard about secure is, but it protects your domain, and it protects your domain by separating it into two two pieces that that is the command and the the query. Let's see how it does that. Now let's say you, you you develop a typical application in a, in a crowd manner, and you have the users table. And well, I, it's a very simple table. I have the user ID, username, and the password. And let's say your your company is going through a security audit, and somehow a new requirement came, and then your boss or your manager asks you to to answer the following query: that how many times did the user change their passwords? How would you do this? I'd like you to think about it, and if you can make it, maybe you can just talk back. Well, you can record the state every time, right? Stick it in a database. Done. But wait, do we, are we confined to just that table? Like, is that the only table we have? So uh, it's, it's up to you. It's, it's an open question. I mean, you do it like a group. You do a group by query on the username, and you can get the frequency counts. I'm assuming that the ID is just an ID for the record ID, and not the username. ID. Would you would you use the latest for a username and just make a make it immutable? Yeah, but please note that there is there is no counter or something like here at this point of time, right? How would you know how many times did they, they change? So every time the, 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 the user changes his password, the only thing changes is the password column, right? And how would you, how would you count it? You need to well, count it somewhere. Every time they change it in plain text in a text file, <laughs> and then you just go through with WC. And I mean, you, you, have know, to count you would have to have a lot of, they have to have a lot of tables. Anytime you call the change password yeah. function, you go ahead and you say, a usual ID in that table, and that's it. I mean, you can any time you call it. But right? if you do that, the world only starts when you start logging in. But that's fine. But you guys aren't being creative enough. What you do is you say <laughs> that the user can't change their password, and <laughs> these <laughs> guys are how many times they changed it. That is the solution. It's zero. Okay. So you create the password for that. Oh, I'll have a comment. Okay. <laughs> Change data capture is never the answer <laughs> until it's the answer, but it's never the answer. I'm using change <laughs> data capture right now. I mean, I mean, I'm assuming this table has has the record of everything. So you just basically just do a group by query question <laughs> information. But, but seriously, but change data capture from SQL Server only gives you like seven days uh, by default. Um, so if you were interested in the last seven days of users changing their, ba their passwords, then you're good. Well, okay. So effectively, starting at the time you enable change data capture, you, you make the users table the log table. You, yeah. you could potentially query the, the SQL Server logs. To get all of the update statements. Oh, that that's that will be a little bit overkill, I would say. So <laughs> let me just let, let, let me just wrap up. Thank you for your very creative ideas. <laughs> I'm saying CQRS is the answer. <laughs> we can spend the rest of the meeting I, I, on this question clearly. <laughs> I, the password is in plain text. Like, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I don't. It might be. Yeah.
So my naive approach would be just to introduce a column, just just that counts. Uh, it's a very naive approach, but it would work. They just introduced a column here that is just okay. password change count. Okay. That's not vulnerable enough. That's not vulnerable enough. <laughs> that doesn't match with three enterprise patterns. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. And architecture review. <laughs> yeah. I'm but, sorry. But Please, once you, you <laughs> once you add a column, then such a column, then the problem is you're effectively changing your data model, but also you you're you're obligated to propagate this backwards all through all the way up to your application. That means now once I make such a change. I need to change my domain model. I need to perhaps, let's say, I, as a, uh, my, my naive solution was to add a column. And then I, if I use something like an entity framework, I need to, now I have to go to revisit my domain model and then introduce a property that represents the uh, change of number of, cha number of password changes. That effectively says whenever someone wants to query something and that, that, does, that doesn't exist in my database, I need to, I need to change the core part of my, my domain. And every time you change your core, the core part of your domain, you need to make a deployment. And every deployment has a potential risk. You can introduce bugs. Well, this is this case is very naive and simple, but actually it's what you're doing. So what's, what security is trying to do is, if we can manage to separate these read concerns, perhaps we can get away with handling this, such a queries only by dealing, the, the, dealing with the changes in the query part, which is non-critical. Whereas you can keep your, your core domain unchanged and which mitigates the risk, okay? So that's the, that's the primary motivation why, why CQRS is valuable. It protects your domain where it relinquishes, it just leaves you many, many times, whenever a change is happening, you can get away by not touching your core model, okay? But, so, once, so, 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 is, yeah. Let me interrupt. So, are, are you making the argument that this allows you to keep a minimal database and push as much as possible into code? I wouldn't necessarily say database because, again, let's we have to think of mentally. We have the query and the command side of databases as well. And I'm, what I'm claiming is that the command side is your core model, which is raw value will more critical. And you can get away without touching to that place where you will eventually have to touch because there's a new query. You will have to touch to your query model and you will have to you'll probably have to touch to your query database as well. But a mistake that would happen there, which would be far less critical that would happen in, the, in your command and query side, command, command side, sorry. So this is what they're arguing. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's super helpful. Thank you. Yeah. So that, so the, uh, as I said, this is this is the primary motive of CQRS rather than the, the other benefits. So it protects your core domain. But we are not we, we are not finished with this problem. So. Uh, once you add the solution, then the, the, the next question can arrive. What will be the frequency? Like then how many, how many times does it, did you use a change your password within the seven days per period or just daily, something like that. Then you still can't answer that question in, with this naive change. Well, you, 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 that, you then have to resort to creating another table where it just timestamps every time a user change a user changes their data and then, well. And CQRS with event sourcing is actually the event sourcing part of the CQRS records everything happened in the system. We, even if you want it or don't want it. And that way you never lose anything that happened in the system as long as you're intended. So if, if, if there's a command change command, sorry, uh, password change command comes out, that would eventually yield a password change event or password change failed event. Perhaps there's a policy against changing, can fail or succeed. And then 
you will be tracking, even if you're not interested in password in this query in the first place, you will have all those events time stamped and sorted in your in your data store already. So you don't have to worry about, well, what if my boss asks me this query in the future? You don't have to think ahead if you if you already record everything that happens in the system. Okay. So in that sense, it also helps you to protect your 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 domain. So here's another example of event sourcing. Uh, and this is a little bit more different domain where you have place orders. In, in a typical crowd database, we have the orders table and we can just create whenever an order is created. In, in, in the CQRS with event sourcing, what we, what we create is just the, the, the set of events. And I think this terminology is a little bit wrong here. Uh, you should say order place, not order created, because if you say created, it's in, it still leads to crowd mentality. Uh, we should use a little bit more proper uh, naming as well. But eventually what you do is that whenever an order created or updated, so you just immediately, you, set, you create an immediate set of events and that just constitutes your, your event log. And whereas there's again, starting from some sort of offset. Uh, why there is an offset? Because you will, your system may be restarted and you just, there's no guarantee you will continue to run your, your system indefinitely. Um, you record some offset and then from start, from a starting offset, you just replay uh, and uh, I'll aggregate those events into the regular order table as we, as we know it. So that's the event sourcing part. The second benefit is also, this is very understated when, when it comes to regular applications. It handles concurrency. Let's talk about concurrency. So concurrency represents here, for example, your application is a typical web application and there are multiple users trying to access a single resource. And as I said, it's a very underrated problem and it's a very real problem. So this code is actually written by a uh, distinguished en engineer of Microsoft, David Fowler, which is the creator, creator of SignLar, maybe you know him. Uh, and he, he, this is an example from uh, a to-do MVC application. And there is something wrong with this code and it's not his fault because there's, there was some sort of limitation which we talk about it. What do you think, what could, good, what could go wrong with this code? What do you think? All right, there's nothing wrong. It can stop in the middle. It can stop? Yeah. You're saving at the end. Okay. But assuming this is rather wrapping into into in, well, it's, it will run in, in 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 a transaction. I mean, once you do that. So, let's think about a concurrent problem, concurrency rate way of things. Let's say two people are trying to update, or best, for example, in one case, one is one person is deleting this this record while one one is updating. What's going to happen? So there's already a check here. If you can see, there's a if await db to do's, and if if there's no, it checks with any async, and if there's no record there, it will just return not found, right? There's, it's already some appears to be protected from that from some such cases, but it's actually not. So because databases work, uh, uh, handle the transactions in an isolated way, if Consider two transactions. One is trying to delete a record, and the other one is just trying to um, um, query it or save it or just insert it. So let's say you're trying to update a record. And before you update that record, someone has deleted it, right? And what will happen is that your, your, your update transaction will say, mm, I, su I successfully updated your record. That's what you get. But eventually, you will have no update at all because you, someone has deleted it. So it may look like a very, very subtle problem, but even a simple CRUD, CRUD application is vulnerable to this kind of thing. You may not worry about, well, uh, uh, maybe there are too few users in your system, which will revisit that concept. Uh, and David Fowler is a smart guy, and I talked about it. And then in the next iteration, he somewhat improved as much as possible um, with entry framework seven, offered a different utility, and this is the same code for the. Uh, it's, it's a newer commit for the same same code, and in this case, what he does is, 
calling the entity frameworks execute update async instead of doing that. And most relational databases, when you execute an update statement, they will tell you how many rows affected. The database returns that as an integer, okay? And then what? This is what he's using, just to just to circumvent that problem. Now in this new version, he's checking if the rows affected is zero or not. If the rows affected is zero, then apparently someone has deleted it, and it somewhat helps the problem, but it's still not a, not a pure solution. Now. You can say, hmm, I have few users, right? I don't care. I'm not. I only have one user. And you may believe that you're 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 not you're not you're not vulnerable to this kind of problem. But then, think about you made a UI and then you you just user, just click this button multiple times, and there's no guarantee which request when when you work with TCP/IP, there's no way you can know which request will go at the same first or second, and you can just create a very simple rest condition just by, by, by having a single, year, single, single user. Well, I can disable the button, right? It's just a UI thing and I can prevent that problem. Then, well, that means you're, you're trusting your user. First of all, a malicious user can just undo this very easily. I can open the HTML and then just try to corrupt your database. Maybe there is a colleague who doesn't like you in your company. Uh, or, or it could be a web service, and this time there you have a far less control about over concurrency. You're calling calling the service, uh, and then can cause this con kind of concurrency problems. Here's another problem. Uh, so when I learned about database transactions uh, in the first place, what I what I read about well, we create a transaction. You're transferring some amount of money from one account to another, and uh, if the transaction commits, all is good. If it doesn't commit, all is still good, right? <clears throat> because we are not going to, uh, since the transaction in the asset database offers atomicity, we are never going to end up in a corrupt state, which is very good. And let's say when, once we're trying to transfer some amount of money, we are trying to we first check the balance. Let's say we have a hard bound rule in an invariant that you can't overdraw. We are trying to check if your, bal if your, if your balance have enough amount of money, we're going to transfer the money, right? But what's going to happen when you have concurrency? Then let's say these two, two simultaneous transactions are trying to withdraw money from the same, same account. Both of them are checking if there's enough balance. If there's $1,000 in the first account, and bo both are checking if there's enough balance, both, both code will say, yes, there's enough, bad, there's enough balance. But there's not enough balance for both transactions. And since there's the threats, the transactions are isolated. These things don't know about anything about each other. They are not aware of each other and they're going to both, both succeed and you will end up with your corrupt uh, database record. You're going to end up with, I don't know, depending on the condition. Uh, both transactions will say, well, we successfully transferred your money, but actually only one, one will succeed, right? So, oh. so the, the, the concurrence problem does exist. And it's it's everywhere actually, in, even in a simple web application. We don't think about much, but it's actually uh, I'm a little concerned about the minor possibilities, and it can happen. What can we do about it? In a typical way, um, if you use something like an entity framework, crowd bay is one way is to use uh, optimistic concurrency or pessimistic concurrency. In in optimistic concurrency, we 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 decorate our table with a version or timestamp column. And then every time we make a change in the row, we check if that, we, we do it via update statement. We check if the update statement returns at rows affected. And how we do that in the, in the, in the update statement, we introduce a where condition against the version column or timestamp. So that if only the timestamp matches or the version matches, the update statement will succeed. So that's the optimistic concurrency we call. But if it fails, you need to retry. And there's the pessimistic concurrency part where you would just lock the row, rely on the database. Many databases offer uh, locking the row. And then no other transaction can just read the row. Even you're, you're locking, at the, uh, locking at the row level. But then this is very vulnerable to, um, um, it, what do they call deadlocks. Uh, it, it really happens a lot uh, if, you, if you try to use uh, locking of a row. So, 
two, two transactions trying to read the rows in opposite order, then the database gets to say, well, both transactions are locking each other, then it will kill one of the transactions. So what can we do about it? Um, so the solution that CQRS, this kind of architectures would offer is just, let's just make a proper domain driven design. Let's define our transaction boundaries per, per aggregate. Uh, in domain driven design, the, the concept of aggregate is just, it's something that represents a transaction boundary and it also represents an invariant. So let's, what is, what is our, our invariant here? An, an account cannot overdraw. Then we, we, can, we can effectively create an aggregate and transaction boundary uh, over a, per account. So in typical, you're, if you apply some, some things like units of work pattern, right? You create a transaction at the beginning of request, you do a lot of things and then you commit. What you're doing is you're effectively creating an aggregate boundary in your entire domain. But that's a, that, that, that creates this kind of problems. Whereas what we can do is we can create a transaction boundary for each each aggregate, but then you have to you you have to also coordinate them. So if you're familiar with two-phase commit protocol uh, in distributed transactions, this is something we have to do. We have to check if both transactions are succeed and then follow it. Let's see in, in some sort of sequence diagram how this would work in in a little bit more secure pattern, and this is a bit of a simplified version of it. I also will talk about a little bit more detailed version of it. So there's a customer who 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 is willing to transfer money. So you can uh, you can see the arrows. There's a sequence diagram. There are numbers. The red arrows represents the commands, and the blue arrows represents the events. So we want to transfer the money. There's a command handler just forwards the uh, accepts the transfer money, and then it it issues a command to the source account and stating that well I need to I need to transfer some amount of money, and that source account just reserves the amount. Okay, just doesn't commit yet, but it just reserves that it's going to commit that. And then there's some sort of uh, state machine, uh, which I call sagas, which is a little wrong terminology, uh, which takes it over from that point on. And then it, 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 just, it just communicates to the target, tar, target account. And then target account also gives it their okay. And then once once both both sides reserve their amounts, then, then the, the, the uh, transfer process can confirm the transaction in the first account, and then uh, once once they get the confirmation, it does the confirmation for the second account. So it handles this this traffic, this chatty thing, uh, and then it, this effectively solves the problem because now your transaction boundaries are res are restricted into per per aggregate. The challenge with this is what happens system is crash system crashes in any of between these steps, you need to recover, right? If it crashes or like, let's say that your, your system shut down in step four, what would you do? So another thing that the, we will talk about it. The, so we talked about the CQRS protects your uh, domain, we talked about it handles concurrency. But also there's another annoyance with the typical CRUD. The source of truth. So I'd like to ask you, once you what, in your applications, you, you develop applications, what is the source of truth? Really? No, I, I know the answer. The source of truth is reality. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, that's not a joke. I'm serious. The source of truth is reality. Everything else is just a weak reflection of that. I mean, that's true. That is true. The database is actually a part of reality as well. <laughs> <laughs> no, a, data, a database is a record of reality. I assure you the database exists in reality. <laughs> it does, but it doesn't contain the reality of how much money is in my account. <laughs> we have philosophers. What is reality? As yeah, you know, part of this group. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so you, you just step right into it. Open up some doors, man. <laughs> we have like humanities people, social scientists, I, philosophers. I, 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 actually, the comp sci people are kind of a minority in this group. 
So, <laughs> no. I would say that like, there might be situations where you might want to keep track of certain digital things that only exist in the database. There's no social tool outside the database, like the password, for instance. You're not going to go ahead and have a real password outside the database. It's not possible. If you have a real password that does not match within the database, the database is social tool, not going to have a real password in the world outside. Uh, John, would you like to respond to the <laughs> idea that? All of reality is in the database. <laughs> no, all of reality is not in the database. Hold on. Just a second. <laughs> it's all in our minds. Are you well, sure? I'd like, I'd, I'd like to respond to John's comment. And he he has a valid point. It's true. No, I, I think he's not joking. And it's true. But the problem with the reality being the outside world is if you if you take that as a source of truth, then you will end up the problem with stability. Because your application won't be aware the instantaneous, it's nothing, it's impossible for your application to be aware the instantaneous um, yes. reality, reality of reality, right? Right. It's, Changes it's, happen in reality outside the system. Yes. Right? It, it's a fundamental problem. So, so to, for something to be a source of truth for our application, it also must not be stale. Okay, that's that's just answer your your that that's why the reality can't be the source of truth for your application because it, it, it it's the, the the thing is just your application's point of view that's that's not the, the information is not there there's no guarantee there but once you talk about source of truth as a database which is as everyone acknowledged then we also know that it's source of truth because it's not stale whatever is there we accept as the as the as the source of truth it's the it's the is the reality we actually assume that's the reality we no. accommodate according to that so many years ago a guy oh, named right. Pat Helen wrote this blog post that said distributed data is like the night sky it, and it's actually like oh. fundamentally really important to understand this like if you go and look like get outside of Houston or whatever city you're in go out in the country you look up at the stars do you know what you're seeing do we have any astronomers Oh, well, you're seeing yes. the light that left those stars many years ago. Yeah, millions, yeah, billions of years. Maybe I can exist. Uh, millions of years ago in some cases, right? And so yeah. that's always true about our databases. Our databases show us the truth of the past. Yeah, that's <laughs> right. That's, it, that's no, actually, it, it's actually yeah. really important to understand if you're designing applications is to Ooh. understand that your truth is in the past. That's true. Well, my, I will my argue, as some of you in the know, future. I will argue that this is a solved problem. It was solved sometime before the year 1400 CE in Europe. <laughs> it may have been solved in Korea earlier than that. But the point is double entry bookkeeping solves this problem by accepting the fact that you can't ever know exactly what the truth at a single point in time is. Yeah. Right? It's what you call eventual consistency. Yeah. It's, it's, it's why you're right about everything, honestly. <laughs> like, it's why CQRS makes sense, is because yeah. it accepts the reality is that, like, things happen, we record our understanding of those things, right? And in some cases, you know, we have to go back and correct our understanding of reality. And that's just the way it is. It's like people who think two-phase commit solve their problem don't understand the problem. <laughs> it, they really don't. But anyway, I'll shut up and let you go. So for me, it's very pestering that I rely something like the source of truth as a database where I'm a developer, I like, I like the source of truth to be my code. The, the rules are the, just, just, I'm coding a lot of rules and then this is pestering me. I'm relying on the vendors. There's a database vendor. They have some sort of features in their database. They can just offer indexing, role locking, et cetera. And then I somehow find it personally very, very annoying that I, I rely on the database that, that much. I'd like to reduce the database to just put it in, into, into its place to be a persistence engine, be a really persistence engine, but a 
least not from a developer's point of view, don't be the source of truth. Well, because we'll, we'll, we'll visit how this goes. So this, this, there we come the Aka.net and the actor thing. But before we jump into the, the Aka.net thing and just, I'd like to ask you another different question. There's a function programmers here. So you, let's say you're developing a simple web application and then the user submits a number and let's say five, six. And what you're doing is you, you need to accumulate this number. And you need to do it in an immutable way in the memory. There is no database. How would you do it? Shall I repeat the question? The user, submits, the user submits some numbers like a five, six, seven. And what you do is you need to add these numbers constantly mm -hmm. as, the user, as the user submits these numbers. You need to do it, uh, this in the memory, but you, you're not going to obvi use an obviously immutable variable to, to hold this in the memory. Uh, how would you handle this thing? Hmm? You, would, you would store the number in some location and then change the variable to point at the new location so you can have it uh, change in a atomic way? Well, for, for example, let me just give you a little more be concise. For F sharp users, you're not going, you're not allowed to use mutable keyword or you're not allowed to use any uh, C sharp or the, let's say BCL level mutable collections. How would you do it? Or is it doable? You have a Once you use mutable, it you're, you're, it and returns it. And returns it, yeah, that's also. That's it's a supplement. That's state. it. It's like you have some state. Yeah. You take a you take an it, you apply it to the state, and you re and then you have a new state that is a function that has applied the it to the state. I mean that that's the way it's done. Yeah, but how, how would you do it in practice in practice? So it's 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 it would be a shame, right? We, we, we talk about function programming, but it would be a shame if you can't do this, if you can't solve this problem without using mutable variables, right? So what what I would do is in, in F sharp, there's something called a mailbox processor. Yep. So if you use a mailbox processor, which accepts a message, well, I can't say it's really pure, Well, it does a lot of threading and a lot of plumbing there in the backend, but it really writes you, allows you to write a recursion and then you just listen for a message, and then you, you can just get the incoming number, add to the add to the current value, and then call the recursion recursive, call, call yourself recursively, and then hold the state as the function parameter. And you will use no mutable variables. Why am I give this example? Because the the actors actually somewhat works in a similar sense. Uh, and Aka.net is 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 one of the frameworks that that just allows you to 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 do this to do so. Um, so, in a typical uh, object oriented programming, you have the object. So an object is something like that accepts a mess a message in in, form, in forms of method call, right? There's a, there's a, there's an object. There's a cat object. You call it uh, meow or just eat something. Then you call these methods. Just like that, in an actor, you just send the message instead okay but the difference is that an object is is somewhat tied into a, it's a, just a pile of data and it's pinned to a memory location even though garbage collector moves it out it still uh, lives in a fixed location whereas an actor is a more broader abstract so when you talk about an actor as an object it doesn't leave it doesn't sorry. It doesn't pin in into a particular memory location. It, it's it's a more abstract concept. It's not like it's, it's it is not just a pile of memory uh, that's floating in the in the in your memory. It's a for example, it can transparently uh, you can access a, an actor for example transparently from another machine as if it's 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 living in your own machine. So you have some sort of built-in remoting mechanism, or it can restart. It has its own own life cycle. It can use a different memory location, but you can still access the same actor on the same place as if it's it's there, even though the underlying objects change. So it's some sort of, it offers an actor some offers you some sort of object like an abstraction. And one of the things that Aka.net offers you in a distributed environment is which we're going to talk. Um, there's some sort of gossip protocol. 
So with, by, by using an ACA .NET, you can just invent a cluster. And let's say there, is an, there are three physical nodes here, A, B, and C. And this course protocol do, does this. Let's say you want to introduce these B and C nodes into your cluster, and they only know about A. Okay, the, so let's you, say that you know the IP address. So you configure that, hey, you configure B that it should connect to A as an its IP address. You, con you configure C to connect uh, A as an IP address. And by using Gossip Protocol, Akadat is allowed to propagate the information of B and C to each other, okay? Even though B and C doesn't know about each other in the first place, by connecting to A, A will tell about a will tell about each other. So then A will tell that B that, hey, there's there's an, there's a C in this IP address. Or A will tell to C that, hey, there's a there's a B exists in this IP address. And when then B and C will be able to connect. So you can build build uh, such clusters with, with ACA.net. That's one of the things about it. Furthermore, um, this is why we're coming how we use ACA.net with, with CQRS. I can offer some sort of cluster sharding mechanism. When I read about cluster sharding, I told them it's a very advanced concept that, that is required for distributed computing. But actually, I use it for my applications. And even there's even though there's a single node, I still make use of it. And in Akadan cluster sharding, you create an entity. Uh, and that entity could be it's an abstract concept. It's not like you create an entity just like using a new keyword and starting an object, but it's it just it pretends as if it existed since the beginning of time. So let's say you want to send a message to an entity that you have never created. You say that, well, I want to create an order with this ID. Then what, what, what it will make that, it will, it will create that actor for you if, if it doesn't exist. And it will just start that actor and it will just receive that actor. And it could be distributed if it's sharded in, into multiple physical nodes or virtual nodes, or it could be on a single machine. But the ACA cluster sharding is what constitutes the uh, your domain level aggregates as entities. They, they, in ACA.net, they call it entity, but it actually constitutes aggregates. How does it look like? An aggregate, uh, an ACA.net aggregate is like, like uh, entity, let's call it, takes a message, and this message takes three parameters. One is the entity ID. It's like your, for example, your order ID. The shard ID, if you are sharding, for example, you can ge geographically shard it. You can say that the orders from USA is, is shard A, orders from Brazil is shard B. And there's the message, which is like the, the place the command, place order command. So once you construct this da data structure, and then you just send this to the act to, to, to the, I mean, you just dispatch this message and it will find the relevant, relevant actor. And it will, it will just start it. Okay. So how does an actor process it like that? Let's say you have you have a login mechanism. Then you the red arrow just here represents a, a login command, and the user actor just receives it and then decides on the outcome. It could be either login succeed or login fail. This is what we did. This is what we told so far. In my design pattern, there will be cases where you would start a saga. So what a saga is like it acts like a distributed transaction coordinator, and not not every event will cause uh, a saga st start. For example, here we have emitted the login successful event, and there I design a saga starter, another actor here, which can decide or not. I mean, I mean it will decide. Maybe a, a a different saga needs to be started for this thing. What will the saga do? We'll, we'll just revisit in this in this next slide. So this is a little bit more broader picture um, in, in a real application of how would you transfer some amount of money uh, by using um, Aka.net and using these these um, actors. Here we have actually um, five actors. The saga starter is something like a global. So it exists in one 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 single piece. The transaction, the account sender and account receiver are three aggregates that are um, that constitutes our domain aggregates. The transaction saga is also another actor which represents the uh, which core which acts like a transaction coordinator. 
here in the number one arrow, we, we issue that transfer money. And this, this creates a transaction actor. And the next thing it just, it issues, a, it emits an event called transaction started. The saga starter will say, well, okay, it will issue the third arrow, uh, start with the start, it will start the saga. And once the saga started, it will tell the saga, the saga started that it started. And then it will tell uh, the fifth fifth arrow. It will tell the transaction entity to continue. Once we get the continue go, the saga start the the the, um, the transaction will emit the sixth event that the transaction started. Then the transaction saga will coordinate the events. It looks like a chatty traffic, but if you look at the each circle isolated way, it's actually not that but chatty. Uh, on the left-hand side, you can see that the transaction saga first will send the seventh arrow with reserve amount. The eighth amount will, will say uh, amount reserved. And then it will do the nine and 10th arrow, which is the, for the account reserve, uh, account receiver. It will also, well, probably add a plus amount. And once both sides are completed with the uh, uh, amount reserved um, messages come, then you, you issue complete complete to both sides and you get the 12 and 14 messages to get that they're they're committed and once they're committed uh you issue the 15th arrow that you're notifying your transaction aggregate and then you say it's complete and then the 17th arrow states that you're notifying your caller that all this all is completed so at any stage if trans this transaction fails let's say your your, your process crashed the transaction saga will bookkeep. What was the last number we have executed? Let's say it was seven. Then it will re re replay the replay the same message to the to the same actor. And that way, it is possible to just you can just continue the process even if the process crashes. Okay, and each of these actors just they offer their own invariants, their own rules, their own transaction boundaries, and uh, then. You can see all these blue arrows, whatever the message, they will land into the database as a persistent event, okay? So you can say that, well, there's a transaction started uh, and then uh, there's an amount reserved, they're completed, and then you will have a set of events that is that exist in your database. So, so the no, quest quick question. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so, so every time a saga is sort of hitting the transaction saga, that's making a call to the database, or is that happening just in memory? Well, whenever you generate an event, whenever you generate an event, you persist that event. Okay, that's okay. that's done by the actor, and I'll show you how the code does that. Uh, whenever you generate an event, you persist that event, and the actor itself is is responsible for persistence here. Although it's a little bit less ideal, sounds of separation of concerns, it, it works well. Okay. There's one problem here. So in regular objects, we have the garbage collector. So I created these actors, right, in the memory. Now they're floating somewhere. What will happen like five hours later? Will they stay indefinitely in the memory? So we, we need to garbage collect them. And Akaranet offers a, a mechanism called passivation. So passivation is something like, and if an actor doesn't receive a message for two minutes, for example, by default, it will remove it from the memory, uh, but it will do it such a way that it will handle it uh, in a graceful way. I mean, you will never lose a message once it's doing that, okay? This is called a preservation. And this configure, well, there's a, there's, a, there's a configuration here, so it's by default 120 seconds. There's another problem here. Let's say your process crashed, right? And then you restarted. Who would who would restart your saga? Because saga was the continuation point. And Akaratnet, there's a concept called remember entities, where if you mark an, an entity as remember entities, there's a switch for that. It will restart those entities automatically on the boot when you boot, boot your application. And typically, this is ideal for sagas. It will it will create um, uh, it will restart those sagas. It will only restart those sagas. And then the sagas will just dispatch those events and will continue the process. Let's look at it from some F sharp. So we talked about too much theory. 
how would you create an actor with F-sharp? Well, you can, it's, it's just as a very short thing, actually, if, even this is an FSX file. And well, the, the Hyperion thing isn't even required. You just reference the Aklink, which is a wrapper, an F-sharp wrapper over Akka.net. You create an actor system. And what you do is you create a recursive function here, just as I, as I described. And you can see there's, it, it's wrapped into an, an actor computation expression. And what we do is we, we let bang, we, we list just like, it is very, it looks very similar to um, uh, mailbox processors where we just receive, wait for the message. And the, in this case, the message tends to be a string. If the message is a stop, for example, we return a special token called stop, which stops the actor. Or if it's an unhandled, we, start, we return a special token here called unhandled, which logs and messages unhandled. And if it's anything else, we're just printing the, message here and we're just recursively calling ourselves. So here, what is the state? What do you think the state for this loop? So the rule is the recursion, the recursing parameter is the state. In this case, it's unit. So that's our state. There's, you can say there's no state. Because the unit is the is the, the one we are recursing. But if it were, it could be anything, it could be a real object, it could be a number that whatever we are recursing would be the kept in the memory. And in the below, you can see how we create the spawn anonymous. For example, is one of the ways to construct this actor. And uh, then you can use this funny operator uh, send a message to the actor. Okay, that's it's it's also type safe. So in this case, if you use this operator, you can only pass a string. You can't pass an integer. It won't compile. How would we handle the persistent one? It's slightly tricky. In this case, we have a real state. So our we have a um, uh, we have a counter changed. I think it's used as uh, the message, and the counter command which we can increment and decrement the state, and then we have the get state thing. So in this case, our loop has a variable called state. And by default, it is initialized as zero. You can see that at the bottom, it's a, there's a loop zero statement. And once you see, once you start that, and then the, the message, uh, it, our actor will, will will start listening messages. Once you initiate command inc, in the below, uh, we will capture that command message, and then it it checks if it's inc. You can see that it it issues a special token called persist. Once Akka.net gets that message it will persist the event to database. Okay, that's how persistent event. And once the persistence succeeds, it will call this event thing. It will, you will get another message where that will match the event part of it. So you see, we first persist the message and then we recursively call ourselves and we change the state again. We just add the number in the, in the loop part, in the event change return loop part. And that's how it works. This is how a simple persistent actor works. Uh, we just issue the commanding, 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 and then uh, command decrement. And then also we can, can get the state, which we don't get the state for the uh, for the actors for the real for the real case. Uh, we are we are we, are, we shouldn't do this. Uh, so. Akka.net's persistent mechanism works with several databases. Uh, it works, I mean, at a lot of databases. It works against SQL Server. It works against SQLite, PostgreSQL, MongoDB, Oracle, MySQL. I used it at SQL Server, SQLite, Oracle, myself. Uh, uh, perhaps, I, I would say most ideal might be MongoDB because what you're, what you're, what you're storing is like a serialized form of the event. And probably it would it would make sense to use MongoDB, but the other ones also work well. Uh, you are not going to query the JSON data directly. Uh, it also supports things like Cassandra, even I know, and Azure Cosmos DB if you go to that extent. And this is how we do how uh, the cluster sharding works. So I'm not going to talk, spend much time, but eventually what you do is you you pretend as if an entity exists and you send a message. To, to that. There's a factory of it. You specify the shard ID and the entity ID, and then you can send the message to that. And this is how you, you, you work against 
uh, ACA cluster sharing with F sharp. There's an important cycle once you message once you receive a message, uh, you first validate the command. For example, you get a place order command. You first validate it. Maybe there's a, enough stock or not. Then you decide you generate an event. Let's say there's enough stock command placed, so order placed, sorry, or order rejected. You apply the state, such as reducing the st stock. You persist the event to the database. Then you publish the event. You, so you follow these five steps, and all of them would, would happen atomically. There's no, nothing will come in between. Because the actors are, you see that there's a message you're listening. They will not accept a message unless you, you, will, you will run through a full cycle. Okay, so this, this thing will happen in a single transaction. I have some pers personal uh, side project, for example, uh, where users, for example, make a calculation. Uh, and then uh, typically in Akka.net, uh, this is how I model my commands and events. So let's say that, for example, you can add a credit, consumer credit, or you can just, a user can log in. And the outcomes of these events are just comments is, is, is here. So notice the difference between a command and event is Command represents something, a, a demand that can fail. An event represents something that has already happened, which cannot be undone, okay? Once an event has happened, it's, it's done. You it's, it's, cannot undo it because it's happened in the past. Uh, and this is a, well, it's another snapshot of how I invoke the, the actor, which I will not talk about much. Um, uh, and this is how a real actor looks like in, in, in F sharp on the, on the left-hand side. So you can see that um, there's an important part called recovery. Whenever your actor crashes or just you, you close, shut down your system, you need to restore the state. And the, by default, what Akka.net does is it replays all those events from scratch. And then you just reapply those events. And then, then that's how you restore the state. However, this may not be ideal. And the reason being is that if you have 1 million events, you don't want to replay them every time your, your system bootstraps. And there's another mechanism for Rakuten that they offers called snapshotting. So time to time, you need to snapshot the current state, let's say every 100 message. And then it will first fetch that latest snapshot and then replay the remaining events on top of it. This is built into Akka.net as well. And well, here's another code uh, showing uh, this is the, this is the ap apply state. So once you get a get a get a new command, how would you change the thing in memory? Okay, uh, so it is just a regular function. There's nothing special about it. You get the event, you get the state, and then you just alter the state and you just return the newer version of the state. That's all about it. How does it look in the database? So. You can see in the right hand side, uh, there's a, the, the, this is how Akka.net fulfills the database. So there's, the, the, there's a persistent ID that looks like the, the, um, the, there's a column here, persistent ID that shows the actor name. There's a sequence number, shows that what is the message number for this actor. Uh, there's some sort of manifest that is used for serialization. And there's a timestamp, there's a payload, uh, which is the actual serialized message. Uh, it's a shame I didn't show the payload itself. What about the read side? So in the read side, uh, Akka.net offers something called Akka, uh, Akka streams, where you can subscribe to a stream of events. So you don't need to go to database, read them manually. And it actually gives you a stream of events and you can just uh, get those events and uh, do your own aggregation and then fulfill your regular table. Oh, well, this is, for example, I'm using a, a Scott provider here. I get a message called uh, credit consumed. And here I, I go to uh, credits table. I found a table. I just deduce the credit and I just commit. When I commit, I also commit the offset number, uh, some number that, that reminds me what was the last event I pursued in, in the same transaction. So that whenever I, I restart my process, I know what was the last event I created. So this is the, the commit part. I'm using a SQL provider here, and it's just commits the uh, offset value and the, uh, the regular table in the same transaction uh, in the same thing. So the offset table looks like this. 
for each projection engine, uh, I have a simple single line. And for example, there's the user's projection engine here, uh, which is usually how you will have one projection engine per application, but can you have multiple ones? And then uh, you have the offset count, as well as you can see this is the regular table. This is the, the CRUD table on the right-hand side. That's actually the user we are uh, constructing. It. Uh, I have some live examples. Uh, one of them is I'll just show you. Uh, I have a workshop here. The source code is available. Uh, it's called Fun Pizza Shop. And I'll just post the, post the link here, how it works. Uh, and this is the live, it's a live demo application I, I created for, for this workshop. Um, you can order a pizza here. Uh, this is running on this full secure cycle. Uh, so something like that. You placed order. Well, it will ask me to log in. And you can play with it, uh, or if you're interested in, in uh, having the workshop, you can just contact me. But that's this is my this is pretty much about my pre presentation. It was a bit lengthy one, uh, but that's it. So once I placed order, uh, you see there's a little bit of asynchronicity here. It just shows the details a bit late. And through a web, web, so, uh, web socket, it actually, uh, based on the events, it reacts actually. So you can see this is moving up now, right now, it's through a web socket connection. Thank you for listening. Uh, if you have any question, feel free to shoot. All right. Um, well, that's a good help. Will a pizza actually arrive? Yeah. Do you, do you know that to make a pizza? They're already here. I know it's really late there. I'm, I'm surprised you're going to make a pizza right now. Eventual consistency. Yeah. Pizza must appear. Eventually. Yeah. Eventually, it will arrive. Questions. This is a very dense topic, I know. Uh, it's it's fairly, it's not easy to grasp at, but, uh, at, at first hearing if you're not familiar. But I just, my objective was to uh, at least familiarize with concepts. Uh, we can have their own, have your own ideas, how, how these things work, or maybe you can develop your own framework or use something existing one. Uh, but it, it's, it's not easy to chew. Uh, at first, so you need to one need to play and experiment, uh, and you should consider the as I said as a summary uh, the motives, what benefits you get. So I, I told about I talked about how it um, helps you to protect your domain model uh, from your changes. You have the all the events recorded in your system, and you can just get away with some of the changes in the query side. It handles concurrency very well because actors are test safe by default. So you, you, you will never have two messages at the same actor uh, in the same actor at the same time. Uh, and as well as it, it actually gives you gives the developer the control back to you, whereas you don't rely on the database as, as the source of truth as much as, as, as before. You will have the control in your actor, you will have the code. I, I particularly enjoy this this part of the thing. Uh, when I when I use entry framework, well, I have entities hydrated. Uh, from database, but I, you don't know if it is the single, if it is the only entity at that time in the memory. If there you have two two, two concurrent uh, requests, then you have you will have multiple instances of same entity with same ID. Then just it's a bit of, it becomes a very loose concept. Uh, on the drawback side, if you see there's a ch chatted traffic you need to manage, you need to think, worry about um, how to handle the. Uh, transactions in a distributed way. Uh, it's not for faint hearted. Uh, so it's a trade off. Um, I do have a question. Uh, and, you know, like I've, I've worked with CQRS before, but um, never in ACA. Um, so uh, when your domain changes over time, um, the maybe the, you know, the meaning of a command may, you know, subtly morph over, you know, over time, um, and you're, you know, replaying your history. Are, are you doing some sort of uh, versioning for your commands, or how are you? 
How are you managing that change? Yeah, that's a very legit question. Uh, so command versioning isn't so much big trouble, but event versioning is a big trouble. Uh, the reason is that uh, in particular, uh, once your events change, you uh, you're 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 trying your you from your persistence you will get the earlier versions of your events, okay? Then you it's, yeah, and you have to tackle with this uh, how would you deserialize them and uh, appropriately. So the the ideal approach is that you you would so I, I explained uh, the events are represented in the discriminate units. So the ideal you would create a newer version of the events. As a as a as a new as a as an another step of discriminated union, a new discriminated union, that would work fine. Uh, but otherwise, uh, if you want to if you want to do it, uh, you can also do control the deserialization because F# -sharp has some offering with the option types, right? So then, while deserializing, you can just say that well, I introduce another sum of something, and then. Um, for the older versions of those events, that it will be none, and then you will have the handle. Have to handle. One thing you need to be careful is that you should not share these events across your uh, application much. I mean, sharing events is just something very dangerous uh, because you you make if you share events and th those events changes, then you make things very brittle. So it's it's al although when we can say, think of well, I, if I have an event, why don't I share it? Uh, if you want to, if you want your application to to communicate with other applications, I would recommend uh, using a separate set of events that's outside of your CQRS event cycle. Uh, that would be my answer. So basically, I would say I would suggest you create a newer version of those events uh, and comments rather than messing with the old ones if you can. I was just curious. So you mentioned that you're using a WebSocket to notify the browser. Um, are there any good abstractions over that? I mean, I've, I've, I've had difficulties working directly with WebSockets, like Signal R or something like that. Or do you have any recommendations in that direction? Yeah, I, I used, uh, there's something called um, uh, Elmish Bridge. Oh, oh OK, yes, yeah, I'm, I'm familiar with that. Yes, yeah. OK. And, uh, to be fair, its documentation is super confusing, and how how to use it properly, it took quite a time for me. Uh, but that's what I use. Okay. I, I feel comfortable with it. It's a very good thing. Uh, so you have this Elmish loop in the client side, and the, there's an Elmish loop in the server side. It it just really complements it very well. Yeah, that sounds nice. Thanks. Um, one thing, oh, one thing I just wanted to comment was that you know I I found so when Chris and I started working on this Bolero project, um, I found owners repo um, out in the wild, <laughs> and um, I thought it was it's really refreshing to see. Uh, a, a nice sample project with you know some some depth to it and you know you you talked earlier about how you wanted to give like a sort of a real world example and i think that there's in general but then in within the f sharp community in particular there's sort of an alarming lack of resources of how to actually put together a real world application and uh, so I was very grateful to see. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's, see that's true. Like that's that. This is what I'm was trying to address in my own capabilities, uh, mm -hmm. at least from my own part. And this is understandable. Function programming, I think, still didn't make didn't become the mainstream, and that's that's why we lack of these resources. And I I, I think no one is perfectly sure. How would you develop a simple uh, application like a CRUD uh, in, in a functional way. There are different ways, different different things, but there is no one standard way. Just like the it's established in in the in the OOP world, the way it is. So, uh, mm -hmm. in my own capabilities, I try to address this thing. Uh, yeah. 
Yeah, well, it's a great resource. I, so I think um, that is the perfect place to stop our recording. And after we stop the recording, we can continue our Q&A. But um, I want to thank you so much, owner. This was wonderful. And so let's give him a big applause. And... Thank you. Thank you so much. Should I stop recording? Stop recording. Yes. Okay.